Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories concerning the attacks of September the 11th. This video contains the main body of key evidence for a 9-11 conspiracy and all the important facts one needs to know in order to understand the real masterminds behind this horrific crime. A major key to the 9-11 puzzle is the amazing story of FBI agent John O'Neill. John O'Neill was the FBI's leading expert on Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. O'Neill quit his job at the FBI after he was blocked from investigating the activities of several aviation students who were training at a CIA-connected flight school known as Huffman Aviation in Venice, Florida. These men, who would later become the lead pilots accused of the 9-11 terrorist attacks, have a very interesting background. Mohammed Atta, the lead hijacker, once listed his address as the Pensacola Air Naval Station. He also liked to hang out at strip clubs and consume cocaine, two things that are strictly prohibited by Islamic law. These hijackers apparently got their Saudi passports as well as their funding through a man named Omar Sheikh, who had connections with both Osama bin Laden and General Mahmoud Ahmed of the ISI, which is the Pakistani intelligence equivalent of the CIA. Ahmed was identified as the money man behind the $100,000 wire transfer to lead hijacker Mohammed Atta just days before 9-11. The ISI has a long history with the CIA, going back to the Iran-Contra scandal and a drug money laundering front known as the Bank of Credit and Commerce International. BCCI's tenants were among others Osama bin Laden, Saddam Hussein, and George H.W. Bush. In fact, BCCI is the only connection between Saddam Hussein and 9-11 that is known to exist. Huffman Aviation also has a history with the CIA. Located next to Barnum and Bailey Circus, CIA agents were sent here to learn piloting skills at the flight school and sleight of hand from the magicians at the circus. So after the Bush administration blocked John O'Neill from investigating these potential terrorists, he left the FBI and was persuaded to apply for a position as head of security at the World Trade Center. He was hired to start on September 10th and died his second day on the job, the Tuesday of 9-11. The next day, Jeb Bush would have all the records from Huffman Aviation thrown into the back of a truck and hastily driven straight onto a C-130, which took off never to be seen again. Nothing suspicious or anything. But let's get back to Marvin Bush and his role on the board of directors for Securicom, which ran security at the World Trade Center up until June of 2000, when Kroll Associates took over. According to Elevator Magazine, there was a nine-month complete renovation done to the elevators and elevator shafts in the two World Trade Center Twin Towers performed by the Ace Elevator Company. According to William Rodriguez, a janitor at the World Trade Center, there was constant construction going on inside these buildings and tenants' offices were getting moved around quite frequently. Finally, according to Scott Forbes and Ben Fountain, there was a full-scale power down and evacuation of the Twin Towers the weekend before 9-11 and before the Monday when John O'Neill would take over as head of security. Given this series of events, it is certainly plausible that Marvin Bush, the president's brother, having full, unrestricted security access to these buildings, could have cleared work teams dressed as elevator repairmen to rig these buildings with super thermite and other explosives. Blueprints and pictures show us that a simple cut through one or two inches of drywall inside the elevator shafts of the Twin Towers yields unrestricted access to four-foot crawl spaces between floors where explosives could easily be hidden throughout the building without detection. There was also $15 million worth of reconstruction going on in World Trade Center Building 7 in the months prior to 9-11 when Mayor Rudy Giuliani built an emergency command bunker on the 23rd floor and installed it with bullet and bomb resistant windows and its own independent secure air and water supply. These renovations were applied only to the 23rd floor, however there were lots of workers going in and out of the building running cable. So we have represented possible time windows where explosives could have been planted inside of these buildings. We also have a series of suspicious events to further indicate something sinister was afoot at the World Trade Center on and leading up to 9-11. The testimony of figures such as Barry Jennings and many of the firefighters and rescue workers whose testimonies don't appear in the official 9-11 report draw further scrutiny to the government's version of 9-11, especially after Barry Jennings was murdered. Furthermore, those brave 9-11 first responders who did speak out also signed away their government-paid medical bills in order to receive free medical treatment for cancer and respiratory illness from the toxic smoke which the EPA told them was safe to breathe. The 9-11 first responders also signed away their right to speak out publicly about the government and what really happened on 9-11. I hope this helps to explain the deliberate failure of the Keene Commission investigation into 9-11 who actually hired Henry Kissinger, a known political cover-up mastermind, to be the first head of the commission before he quit after he was questioned about his Saudi clients and his connections with the bin Laden family. 
He was replaced by Philip Zelikow, who helped Condoleezza Rice write the preemptive Iraq War invasion strategy, and also happens to be author of a thesis paper on creation of public myth. How fitting. The most obvious indication that the entire government investigation and report on 9-11 is in fact a cover-up is the fact that the final report doesn't even mention World Trade Center Building 7. Building 7, the Solomon Brothers building, was the third World Trade Center tower to fall on 9-11. It fell late in the day after much of the city had been evacuated. At 5.20 p.m., this 47-story steel and concrete building collapsed straight into its own footprint in 6.5 seconds. In physics, for something to fall at the rate of gravity, there needs to be no resistance to its collapse, meaning that the support structure of the building would have to be removed by some external force, such as explosives, as there would be insufficient stored gravitational potential energy in this building to account for the massive higher-order damage which was observed. Even if fire weakened the structure, it doesn't account for the symmetrical collapse of the building. Fire is an organic process which moves from one area to another as fuel is used up. The National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, was given the task of investigating the cause of collapse of these structures. It took seven years for NIST to finish their report on World Trade Center 7, and independent professional analysis has found strong evidence that the NIST scientists are guilty of committing scientific fraud. Since it can be proven that they lied about fire temperatures, thermal expansion of concrete, thermal conductivity of steel, removed shear studs, and added combustible fuel loads on the floors where the initial failures took place in their model, ignored prior knowledge of collapse as reported by Aaron Brown of CNN and Jane Stanley of the BBC, and the fact that World Trade Center 7's collapse looks identical to a controlled demolition and nothing like the NIST model. The science and the physics don't lie, and that's why the number of scientists, architects, and engineers who have signed on the petition for a new investigation continues to grow steadily bigger and bigger. If the collapses themselves weren't suspicious enough from a purely scientific standpoint, let's look at some underlying facts about World Trade Center 7. This was a secure federal office building that housed offices for the Department of Defense, Securities and Exchange Commission, FBI, and CIA. In fact, this was the largest CIA headquarters outside of Langley, Virginia. World Trade 7 was a federal building full of government agents whose primary purpose was to monitor the New York Stock Exchange. Investigations into money laundering, stock market fraud, insider trading, including the majority of Enron's financial records, were all destroyed in World Trade Center 7. Last but not least, World Trade Center 7 was the only off-site backup for the military's financial records. Due to the sensitive nature of allowing potential enemy countries to know how much our military is spending, they keep these black-budget records classified and store them in highly secure places. The only other place these files are stored is in the Pentagon's Financial Accounting Office. Oddly enough, on September 10th, Rumsfeld announced that there was $2.3 trillion in unadjusted funds from the Pentagon budget, meaning that the money was unaccounted for, missing. The next day, all the files to track down where that money went were destroyed when something, allegedly Flight 77, smashed into the west wing of the Pentagon. Even more curious is that in the months prior to 9-11, there was a complete renovation of that section of the Pentagon as the walls were reinforced to withstand missile impacts. This was the only section of the Pentagon that had its walls reinforced. During that construction period, many offices and filing cabinets were moved around. It would appear that elite forces within the government used this opportunity to get rid of inconvenient files and people. Another interesting point is that there is no solid evidence to prove that Flight 77 actually hit the Pentagon. The damage pattern on the ground and building is inconsistent with a large commercial aircraft. The FBI or someone else confiscated all the 84 security cameras which caught the incident on tape, and only released five frames from one of them to the public. So this raises the puzzle that if a missile hit the Pentagon and not Flight 77, what happened to the real Flight 77 and all the passengers on board? A close, careful look at the passenger list might give us some clues. There are more top-secret security clearances on this airplane than there are in most medium-sized cities in America. Especially astounding in this bizarre passenger list is the preponderance of Navy personnel amongst the four armed services and a tilt toward propulsion and guidance systems amongst all of the possible secret technologies. It appears that these people were murdered in order to prevent them from talking about systems that they had worked to help set up.